uh, at the outset, I would say uh, I'm really very much excited with uh, the topic that has been uh, decided to be discussed today and uh, overwhelmed by the panel experts that I have. Uh, so, uh, you know, just to uh, start, I would say that we have really come a long way uh, from making a statement of non-inferiority of MIS in colorectal cancer to accepting this as a standard of care. And uh, the way, uh, you know, the industry would talk about disruption, say, in telecom or uh, detail and things like that, I would say that, you know, in colorectal cancer, uh, in about last 30 years, it has really disrupted uh, the surgical aspect, if uh, I, I just have to uh, make that statement. And uh, today I'll try and unravel those uh, uh, building blocks, how really uh, I can justify making a statement of this disruption. And uh, this will, of course, be helped by my uh, excellent uh, panelists uh, on the subject. Uh, and now just to start uh, the ball rolling, uh, this is uh, number one scenario I have, that a 62 year old male with BMI of just 20 and having a cancer of rectum at about six centimeters from the anal verge. And uh, this is uh, MRI staging done by my radiologist is T3B, and one B, and it was uh, he was given neoadjuvant chemo radiation and is now due for surgery. So what is being shown here is that just uh, uh, you know muscularis invasion is found and that's how it is T three B. So uh, my first question is to Doctor Anil, who has a lot of experience of uh, doing minimally invasive surgeries in this field. Uh, Anil, will you be comfortable taking these patients uh, for laparoscopic uh, low anterior resection? Absolutely. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Am I audible? No. Yeah, Anil, uh, still it is cracking. The voice is cracking, but please go. Yeah, ahead. now is it better? Better. better. Yeah, so uh, absolutely, there is no doubt. Uh, we This will routinely come up for laparoscopic anterior resection or minimal and invasive approach, whatever uh, robotic or laparoscopic. Okay. Uh, uh, Anil, my question would be that, you know, uh, I'm sure that a lot has changed in the last 10 years in your practice in terms of technology. So suppose if it, this was a case before about 10 years and uh, at that point of time, what conversion you would have anticipated and has it changed today? that the conversion that uh, you may anticipate? So I think the biggest changes that have occurred are one, obviously evolution as a surgeon, as we go along the learning curve, 2010, we were just about getting, getting our way about in minimally invasive surgery. The other thing is the imaging technology that has changed. I mean, we used to work with single chip cameras that time. Uh, and uh, now uh, we are working with high definition uh, uh, robotic uh, immersive uh, imaging, we are working with 3D technology. I think all this has made surgery so much more simpler, so much more accurate. And I think uh, that has probably the game changer that has happened. Our energy sources are better. I remember uh, working with a simple bipolar, there used to be a little oozing and the whole screen used to go black, uh, making it very difficult to identify structures. So I think all this has definitely changed and made us uh, as surgeons more confident of uh, taking up laparoscopy in even in difficult situations. So uh, you are making a statement that time has changed and everything has helped you. And you are uh, still, you know, but just for the sake of this discussion, what could be the conversion rate at this moment for this kind of a, you know, a, a man of 20 BMI uh, by laparoscopy? Uh, for this, yeah, I would say that it would be less than 1%. I mean, it would be an aberration for conversion. Okay. Especially so, in a BMI of 20, unless there is some anesthesia issue or you know there is uh, some unfortunate event occurring, we would not convert. 
Yeah, so uh, in the hands of uh, Anil, of course, uh, this would be straightforward uh, laparoscopic uh, LAR. And uh, uh, Dr. Dixit, uh, would you like to add anything here uh, that how would you uh, take up this case and do you see any challenge or uh, anything that you would like to share as your experience? No, uh, I think Dr. Anil has already said, but I, I have got something to say. Normally, we look at the patient factor, tumor factor, and the treatment factors. But if you look at that, there are some modifiable factors and unmodifiable factors. If you look at that, patient factors cannot be modified at all. You know, the BMI of the patient is the most important entity. But nowadays, you know, there is what we look at is the intertrochantric distance between, sorry, intertubural distance. Anything more than 10 centimeter, especially in an android pelvis, I think probably you can dissect almost up to the pelvic floor with laparoscopy. I'm confident that. But when we add up the stapling, you know, the, we, we are slightly, you know, short of, you know, getting almost st stapling at the pelvic floor. That is one issue. And the amount of mesorectal fat, because if too much of uh, mesorectal fat, is there, there is a, you know, calculation that if it is more than 225 cc of mesorectal fat, probably the conversion rates goes up almost like 5 to 10%. Uh, probably okay. in this patient as BMI is low and yeah. even though is a male patient, I think sh should be still, uh, as uh, Dr. Anil said, should be good for a laparoscopy. Okay. Uh, so, you know, a uh, lot of work has been done in this field and... Uh, I was, I'm just trying to look at some of the landmark uh, papers, the color two trial, uh, which uh, was the uh, important randomized uh, trial. And uh, uh, it said for the short term outcome that uh, uh, open versus laparoscopy, the quality of resections, complications, and morbidity were the same, but the conversion then, you know, 16% is the conversion. And, Today, my colleague says that there is, he is not worried about the conversion. So that's where we have come a long way in last 10 years as he has eluded. Same way, MRC classic trial also uh, said that uh, long-term results in terms of the overall survival uh, is also uh, better laparoscopic surgery can be the treatment of choice. So uh, that is also not a concern in terms of long-term results. Then, of course, uh, uh, this is the real-life scenario for uh, our patients that, you know, a uh, lot of our patients would have received new adjuvant chemo radiation. And Korean trial has uh, looked into this specific aspect also. And uh, they also come out with this, that uh, uh, we, uh, the local recurrence has been reduced in their laparoscopy arm to just 2.6%. In other words, that they are very comfortable in uh, doing the uh, total mesorectal excision in their patients. Uh, while, you know, uh, while I was just reviewing various literature uh, from the UK to Europe to Korea, but now coming back to US during their uh, early days, uh, this is what uh, they had seen, that they had high conversion rate, and it said that it failed to meet criteria for non-inferiority. So this is what the American experience, which was uh, published uh, post-2013, and uh, another Australian uh, group also looked at their results and they also said that no sufficient evidence for routine use of laparoscopic surgery. And uh, of course, uh, we are in 2021. And uh, as we are discussing and seeing the literature that uh, uh, things have definitely changed. Uh, Dr. Ram Krishna, uh, would you like to comment on any of these five uh, studies uh, which we looked at? Uh, I would just like to point out uh, the Korean trial. It stands out because uh, uh, it uh, more or less replicates uh, the scenario of rectal cancer that uh, all of us face. That is uh, low rectal cancer, locally advanced tumors following neoadjuvant chemo radiation. Uh, prior to this trial, there was uh, no real evidence to support the uh, use of laparoscopic surgery in uh, rectal cancers. 
especially after uh, neo joint chemo radiation but uh, this uh, has uh, more or less uh, cemented the place of uh, minimally invasive surgery especially laparoscopic surgery in uh, rectal cancer but uh, to note uh, these were all performed in high volume centers by very experienced uh, surgeons so uh, that is something that one should keep in mind while uh, considering laparoscopic surgery that uh, you may not always be able to replicate the results that are found uh, that are published uh, in these trials uh, if if uh, i can i would also like to add a point about uh, the patient uh, that you had initially discussed uh, if i'm not mistaken i thought the uh, tumor was reaching up to the mesorectal fascia at around i think 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock no, no so no. this was not involving mesorectal fascia this was okay, purely it was a just t3b uh, so uh, I think, uh, you know, when there was really no concern. I'll come back come to that uh, later part uh, of discussion. So uh, I think uh, as uh, Dr. Kampishna said that, uh, of course, uh, these are the benchmarks set for us and uh, whosoever wants to do, we will have to obviously look at that. These are the results that uh, we need to kind of uh, keep in mind. Uh, now, uh, same patient has got lateral pelvic lymph nodes. I, I mean, like, lateral pelvic lymph nodes. Uh, Dr. Saklani, what is the protocol that you follow for this kind of patients at Pata Memoria? I think over the period of years, uh, things have changed. So now, because of the Ogura criteria has come in, so now uh, any patient who's got lateral pelvic nodes more than 7 mm on the first MRI, we'll receive uh, some sort of neoadjuvant therapy, normally neoadjuvant chemo radiation. And after chemo radiation, if the lymph node size is more than four millimeter or four millimeter, then they will undergo lateral pelvic node dissection. In the Ogura paper, they said there was a thirty percent chance if the lymph node size more than seven mm uh, would become uh, less than four mm, and that will get lateral recurrent system. If you didn't operate on these patients, then about 52.5% would get lateral recurrences. So now they say in the era of TME, lateral pelvic uh, lymph node recurrences or lateral recurrences may be a major cause. But I think the data is still evolving. There's a Lanorex study uh, going on uh, in Amsterdam where they're looking at uh, operating on these patients and looking at both local recurrence and survival. So it can get lateral recurrences down. And uh, this would be complete pelvic lymph node dissection or uh, how do you devise think, your uh, surgery? I think we operate only on the site uh, based on a lot of studies. We only operate on the site where the lateral pelvic node was enlarged and it persistent. So normally it would be unilateral. Bilateral would be less than 20% of the times. I think when you operate on this nerve, sometimes you have to sacrifice the inferior vasectal vessels. Sometimes you have to sacrifice the nerve. So sometimes the morbidity can be slightly higher. And then urinary complications like retention can be high. So maybe unilateral is good. If you are going to do bilateral pelvic node dissection in the nodes for large, at least on the side which is less, you have to save the inferior vesicle because sometimes uh, then there's a problem of bladder preservation if it, if it became too extensive. Uh, Dr. Soma Shekhar, uh, do you want to uh, add, add anything to do this? Uh, do you do lateral? pelvic lymph node dissection if uh, the same criteria what Dr. Saklani described? Yeah, uh, I, I agree with uh, Saklani. Uh, actually, uh, when we audited our 683 uh, robotic cancers, when we found 7 to 11% was the lateral node positivity, even when imaging showed. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Saklani that when the imaging shows more than seven as per the criteria, 30% they expect. But uh, I have found that, you know, when they started off with lateral nodes and after uh, neoadjuvant chemo radiation, if they still have a persistent suspicious node. Uh, when I went back and audited around 68 to 78, 72 of those patients underwent uh, lateral lymph node dissection robotic uh, uh, over the last 12 years in my institution. Uh, I'm actually surprised only seven percent was the node positivity when imaging was there. I'm not telling it's like blanket. I use the same criteria what uh, Avnish told. Uh, if they are still persistent on the imaging after chemo radiation, I go back and it is roughly 68 or 72 cases in our group. 7% was the only pathological node positivity uh, which we found. 
sort of, you know, uh, initially in my first part, I was quite aggressive and enthusiastic in doing uh, the pelvic lymph node dissections. Uh, because, you know, as a surgical onco, you keep doing it in gynae onco. It's quite uh, easy, comfortable for us to do. And since I do robotic, it's uh, adds not more than 30, 35 minutes. Very easy. But off late, uh, I'm trying to change my concept because uh, ideal case, as per the criteria I select, node before, chemo radiation, persistent. Of uh, so many 68 cases, only 7% of them are uh, positive. So sort of, you know, I'm really skeptical. But the bottom line is, uh, it is easily doable either by lab or robotic. Uh, I agree, if you want to do it, it should be those cases who have a suspicious persistent lateral node in spite of chemo radiation. Uh, easily done with very minimal morbidity and other. But uh, at this moment, there is no evidence if you pick these positive nodes, oral survival benefit is what? Uh, but I agree with Saklani that, you know, uh, old time uh, improper TME was clubbed with uh, inadequate nodal dissection as a lateral pelvic recurrence. If you really do very good TME and segregate, uh, I am very doubtful there will be a survival benefit. Uh, but the bottom line is as a case to case, when you do about 100 rectum, you would end up with six to seven patient requiring them. Uh, it can be done safely. You will have 7% positivity, but uh, doubtful overall survival benefit. Okay, I think so. It's seven percent is what uh, we are looking at uh, uh, the positivity rate, and uh, those patients would require dissection. Now, I have one uh, small video which is uh, produced by uh, Dr. Saklani Group, and we'll uh, just uh, play it here. In this video, we demonstrate systematic approach to pelvic lymph node dissection in rectal cancer. The left pelvic lymph node dissection begins by taking the peritoneal cut on the left side of the pelvis. The same cut proceeds proximally to free the gonadal vessels from the underlying structures. Following this, the round ligament was dissected. We begin the pelvic lymph node dissection proper by freeing the fibrofatty tissue over the external iliac vessels. As we move proximally, the ureters are mobilized completely. Here we can see the obliterated vessels being dissected free. During this dissection, we also try to enter the paravesical space after identifying the superior vesicle vessel as seen in this particular image. We turn our attention to the pelvic lymph node dissection proper where we remove all the fibrofatty tissue from the anterior aspect followed by the lateral aspect to ensure complete removal of all the enlarged lymph nodes. Here we can see all the fibrofatty tissue being freed from the external iliac vessels and the pelvic floor coming into view. Proximally, we try to free all the fibrofatty tissue using an energy device to ensure that there is no bleeding from the bifurcation of the vessels and continue our dissection as done previously. As we continue our dissection, we see the obturator nerve coming into view. We then take the obturator vessels using an energy device. All tissues are dissected free away from the obliterated artery and the dissection continues in a proximal manner to the site of the origin of the obliterated onto the internal iliac vessel. We then begin our dissection to define the distal aspect of the internal iliac vessel by freeing all the fiber fatty tissue from the bifurcation and of the internal iliac vessel and the pelvic floor from a cranial to caudal manner. During the same process, we expose the operator nerve in the proximal aspect. Before proceeding with further dissection, the operator nerve is laid bare and freed of all the tissue. And here we can see the lumbosacral trunk We continue tracing the distal aspect of the internal iliac vessel using this energy device. and the dissection proceeds almost till the entry of the lumbosacral trunk into the hyatic foramen. Complete dissection is performed to free the fiber fatty tissue from over the lumbosacral trunk and ensure complete dissection. We completed the lymph nodal dissection after freeing the fiber fatty tissue all around using the energy device. And this lymph nodal mask was then placed into a retrieval bag and pulled out along the specimen. Here we can see the completed template of our lymph nodal dissection.
but uh, we want to uh, reflect on this uh, beautiful video demonstrated by Dr. Sutlani Guru. Thank, thank Dr. Kotari. Yes, I know I agree with so much Ekhar. But I think over a period of time, because we started doing this, we got a lot of referrals. So we've done more than 130 or so. And then we looked at a series of cases of 30 cases. And initially when we were dissecting, we wouldn't reach this lumbocycle trunk. We hadn't seen these. And then we got a few recurrences, which are very difficult to manage, especially along the inferior vesicle vessel. And then we looked at the learning curve and it turned sometime around in 2019. So now the positivity rate has increased from 10% to as much as 38%. And the recurrences have come down. So it has got a learning curve. Miss, uh, I know Somu does a lot of lateral pelvic note for gynae, for colorectal surgeons, or for GI surgeons, we do less of these. So for these, probably the learning curve may be as much as uh, 80, 89 cases. You see, Japanese have been doing this without chemo radiation for a long time. So even with prophylactic lymph node dissection in JCOG trial, they found where they did lateral node dissection, they still had a 7% local recurrence rate. Whereas where they didn't do it, it was 14%. So even in their hands, even after you do lateral pelvic node dissection, there will be a failure rate. Uh, maybe about that. Initially, it was 20%. Now it's coming down. So it's a different one. But I agree with some whether it will improve survival or not. It's difficult to see. So let's wait for the study of Lanorex study. So in the meantime, let's improve our technique and see where we go from there. I don't know what okay. others would say. Yeah. Okay. I think... Uh, Yes. Uh, I would like to add uh, one more tip uh, to the Please. particular. Uh, uh, we have found when we do lateral lymph node dissection, as uh, Avnish told, uh, in addition to the standard uh, external iliac group, internal iliac group, and obturator, uh, ileal lumbar nodes uh, just to the lateral part where the uh, obturator emerges, the part which Avnish showed very well. Uh, that is the undertreated part during learning curve, what he told, because people are worried that is where the obturator artery vein goes. So uh, we have found that the node uh, lateral to, because the conventional thing when you do a lateral lymph node dissection is uh, don't go uh, posterior and lateral to the now in the upper part. Uh, but uh, you must go there, lateral to the upper part of the obturator now. Uh, where the main node sits on the ileolumbar trunk. That is number one. Number two, the nodes behind the vessels uh, are very important. So what uh, I normally suggest uh, in the uh, you know, tip during operative is don't try to approach the obturator fossa from medial end. Uh, straight away, open the space between the external iliac artery and vein and the psoas, and then we just put a loop and then we open. So you attack the obturator fossa ileal lumbar from superior directly through the shortest course than the lateral part. Two, three things are subserved. The nodes behind the vessels are always taken. If the nodes are left as it is on the posterior vascular sheet, the nodes behind the vessels are missed. Second, uh, sometime when you have a high BMA case, post chemo radiation, you unfortunately go beyond seven weeks. Uh, if there is any oozing bleeding around the nerve and the obturator, you go through the lateral end when the endorist instruments are not available in lap or it's a long course you take. If you go directly, separate the vessel and soyas and go straight, uh, then managing that uh, oozing bleeding is very easy. So this is one of the tips uh, I learned and I, I actually transferred to most of the people. Uh, once you do the external iliac packet until deep circumflex iliac went to common iliac division, uh, go between the vessel soya, retract and attack the things above. Uh, all the three things are subsured very easily then. Okay. Thank you so much, Somshekhar. I think uh, we must be very careful in taking those deep notes is what uh, Dr. Somshekhar has said. Uh, now, uh, once again, same patient, but there is a twist that uh, the same patient has got BMI of 30 and uh, T3 becomes T3C and is given neoadjuvant chemo radiation once again, for surgery. And uh, now in this particular patient, I'm genuinely concerned about the CRM, whether I'll be able to achieve in this 30 BMI patient. Uh, Dr. Somasekhar, what would be your option, robotic or open in this patient? Uh, uh, for me, uh, in this particular case, it is definitely robotic because we, we use open lab robotic. Achieving a negative CRM is the most important thing. Of the three uh, technique at this moment, uh, robotic would uh, favor uh, giving a negative uh, CRM. 
unless you do a, a tat ema because you know uh, the main problem with this is seven there is a 7% chance you may come out with microscopic crm positive even though you achieve by minimal access uh, so the only thing that can reduce from 7 to less than 4 is uh, a tat ema so in this case definitely robotic because it gives a stable platform Uh, male narrow pelvis it favors over uh, the optics uh, don't get smudged or fogged as i go down and i do a sharp uh, dissection uh, i can visualize it very well and retract well with a thorough arm uh, so a fixed proper retraction at that right level is required for me so if there is a good chance of coming out with uh, as per the dutch tme criteria a sort of total tme uh, that in my hands uh, would be a robotic this would be the ideal case for a robotic Uh, can lab uh, uh, in a case right and uh, you know this is uh, lar and we are doing the robotic lar uh, what challenge is and how do you handle the splenic fracture in this uh, high bmi patient uh, actually we have developed a single docking technique which we also published uh, we have done a randomized trial on two different port uh, technique Uh, so with a single docking technique uh, uh, you can at least do easily a type 2 splenic fracture mobilization without redocking it uh, same thing also saklani does i have seen extensively in uh, xi he does it many times without retargeting uh, even though type 3 uh, splenic fracture mobilization if you want then you may have to do retargeting of the boom uh, but rarely required uh, what i have found in high bma patient with robotic is Uh, we take the uh, ima at origin imv below the left lateral lower border of the pancreas we have gained maximum mobility and type 2 tme uh, spleen fracture mobilization i do and then i do icg firefly then you will be surprised that uh, most of the time uh, no tension uh, easily sigmoid loop sitting on the uh, you know presacral area with a good vascular loop is easily possible we specially have developed it less than 4 5% i have to do redocking to take the splenic fracture in my case uh, and now uh, when you are doing the anastomosis in the pelvis uh, do you see any advantage of uh, the robotic platform stay plus in this particular situation uh, absolutely uh, we just did a study uh, since last 3 months uh, it is a 3 months now since 3 to 4 months i am using robotic uh, sure form stapler Uh, before that i used to use a power stapler and i routinely found that uh, 76% of the time uh, i required at least two uh, purple stapler if you are using a metronic to transect the rectal uh, stump because we now know that as the number of staple required more to transect uh, that much of integrity of the leak and stitcher increases now with sure form uh, i have fired uh, 62 uh, transections in the last 3 months in robotic Uh, i have found that 95% of the time single 60 green i am able to do it uh, in male pelvis so uh, 210 degree angulation i get uh, i have switched over from 76% to purple to single in 90% uh, so very easy because of the endorist and i control it myself and uh, because it's a, a smart firing it's very easy so these are the four thing which i found i've just made a paper out of it Uh, and we are sending it for a publication in this last some sticker when we were trying to uh, fire those uh, stickers on the rectum a uh, couple of times what happened is that you know uh, it gave us uh, the signal that the tissue is still thick and it could not engage so what is the tip for that when you get this kind of a message yeah. even though i have done you know completely bare uh, the stump i am Uh, see, uh, I agree with you. In case of power stapler in lap or open, you can make the stapler fire no matter what happens. But you know, in sure form, uh, it will not uh, fire uh, unless the thickness is right. And then there is no purple in sure form. You know that blue, green, uh, black, white are what we have currently. Forty-five, and then uh, you know we have sixty. So I had this problem in initial one two. I started off with blue. and invariably blue uh, sure form will not allow you to take it the moment you close it says tissue is too thick you change so uh, now i have started routinely and only use green uh, except in two cases out of this last about the 40 to 50 cases all the time i am able to uh, easily enable fire so i have learned it that i am never going to take blue in sure form. and i also did some uh, you know uh, engineering research on da vinci site uh, the green 
sure form is roughly equivalent to purple metronic which is my favorite in uh, rectum so now i have switched over totally to green so the message i would give for new stapler people is uh, use green never use blue then 98% of the time you will fire only in 2% of the time it may not fire then what i do is i switch over to 45 half uh, i fire from right side and half i fire right from left side because robotic stapler you can take from left and right so uh, bharat can i ask uh, a question to tom sir sir ah uh, yes sir are you able to accommodate the 16 this uh, when the tumor is at 6 cm from anal one then you are firing at the 4 cm from anal one in deep yeah. narrow pelvis are you able to accommodate all, all, the 16 all the time uh, of these uh, uh, staplers i have used uh, roughly i think 64 67 fires i have done in rectum uh, except two patient all were male patients Uh, so i was able to do in fact uh, you know uh, when we used to use uh, assistant port stapler we used to come from supra pubic so supra pubic uh, i drive power stapler is what i used to use always uh, but now i use in male and i am always able to accommodate we come through the anterior superior spine you know in robot you have one port uh, just above the anterior superior okay. spine initially i used to come from the right lumbar port Uh, i face this problem that when i go down the hood of the 60 stapler used to hit the right common iliac artery area uh, immediately i switched over uh, after a couple of cases into the staple port you know that the stapler port is separate when you you have to decide it in between or uh, you know up front so now i switched over totally stapler to the anterior superior iliac in robotic port after that i now don't find a problem because it goes straight down and then i take a little angulation and i'm able to take 60 Uh, in most of the time i i i've never had to change the stapler i've never have misfired it or i had a difficulty we had difficulty in accommodating fixing in many cases so we generally uh, when we are very down in obese patient we generally try to fire 45 plus uh, first stapler is 45 and uh, the second is also 45 see there are two three issues uh, you try what i told number one i put an umbilical tape on the rectus sigmoid and through the epigastric 5 mm port i fully pull and straighten it i come through the anterior superior iliac spine 60 and i am able to always fire uh, i really want you to try this and you will be second thing is you must understand unlike laparoscopy once you use 45 stapler you cannot switch over to 60 the gun for 45 is different gun for 60 is different yes. so there is yes. no looking back yes. cost is double yes sir and sir have you any experience uh, regarding using a black stapler short form uh, black, black no black stapler i use only in thoracic surgery uh, luckily in rectum i never had to use it so far uh, uh, i am not happy with black because it is not a very good uh, ceiling you know for rectum i think it is an important message that you know uh, the positioning of the port and uh, applying uh, not a blue one but the green is what we should use uh, for fire in this now uh, this is what uh, dr som shekhar had published uh, when we are talking about comparing the robotics versus laparoscopy or the laparotomy and uh, he had tme robotic in all 100% of his patients and uh, hospital stay was almost 80% less than the open technique uh, the roller trial uh they they had put a conclusion that this is a negative trial but at the same time there was definitely less conversion to the previous trials uh of the laparoscopy what we were talking about more than digits and uh less crm positivity rate and uh, less conversion in men which were the challenges and uh, this is another korean trial which uh, showed that uh, oral survival Uh, with robotic TME versus laparoscopic uh, TME, there was a definite advantage, and same way cancer-specific survival advantage. So, it concluded that there is a definite potential oncological benefit uh, by doing robotics in this particular situation. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, was a very outstanding. Of course, this is non-randomized, but a single institute trial. which uh, were doing about 100 cases per year uh, completely robotic assisted laparoscopic surgery and uh, they had lateral lymph node dissection as uh, dr saklani mentioned 34.7% of the patient had lateral lymph node dissections blood loss was just 10 ml and the conversion rate was zero 
in 551 patients, zero conversion rate is the most statement that they have made here. And the local recurrence rate was also 0.5% with five-year cancer-specific survival rate in one, two, and three stages where 100% and relapse-free was 93, 75, and 77.6% of the patients. Uh, Dr. Anil, uh, would you like to uh, comment on any of this paper? Uh, we did a meta-analysis of uh, almost 85 trials between robotic and laparoscopic, and it's going to be published uh, soon. Uh, except for the fact of conversion and the hospital stay, there, are, there was no other difference, and four trials analyzed costs which were high. I think as far as uh, uh, high rectum is concerned, mid-rectum is concerned, then I think uh, there, probably there is no difference between lap and uh, robotic as far as uh, um, uh, surgical uh, uh, outcomes as well as surgical ease is concerned. I think the difference lies when you go into the low rectum, and that is where all the advantages of a stable platform better visualization and non-fogging of the camera. That I think is one of the most important things that uh, that comes to my mind. Other than that, the negative part is the obviously is the cost. As of now, I think we the company has to be a little more flexible and uh, more considerate as far as India is concerned. I think. Yeah, that so is, that is what will make robotic uh, much more useful. Yeah, and so uh, you, you said that, you know, those days of double digit conversion uh, in the mid and low rectal cancers are probably behind us and uh, we should be able to accomplish these resections very, very comfortably in uh, experts and like you. Uh, now, as it was mentioned about uh, TATME in one of the discussions, uh, uh, Dr. Saklani, uh, do you have any experience with uh, TA TATME at TMH? Uh, sure, I think uh, we probably did this about uh, two or three years back uh, uh, for about five or six cases, not many cases. The whole idea was even in high BMI patients, sometimes if you're doing laparoscopy and sometimes even in robotic, the last part can become very difficult. And if you did a thing from the transanal approach, the perineal dissection will take a bit longer. And in, it is in these cases where there can be urethral injury as well. So in these cases, so we started doing TATME on this one. Uh, so the learning curve was there. We had already been on the courses uh, there and then we started, but it takes slightly bit longer. The equipment required was also more. We required two air seal systems. Uh, and if you got in a wrong plane, there was an issue. So it, it was possible, uh, but it was taking a bit longer and the learning curve was still there. And for most and of you our, used uh, laparoscopy or robotic? Uh, we did it in laparoscopic actually, but this was two or three years back. So and uh, what kind of port you used uh, at the so uh, we were using the, in three of them we used the teo system itself or we could use the transanal gel port in about two cases or so so we are and comfortable with the teo system so, but the gel port seems to be a good one as well but i think it requires a learning curve maybe 30 40 cases so maybe in the future we can try it out again Okay, uh, so uh, it looks like that uh, we are really in a very early days for TATME because uh, I've interacted uh, with many of you and I think double digit experience is still lacking in our country. But, uh, you know, uh, the major uh, advantage of TATME is what uh, people are talking, talking about is the CRM positivity, which is about 7% they, they are aiming at that. We should be able to bring it down to 4% by doing this. Uh, coming uh, for uh, the colon cancer, Dr. Bharat Prajapati, uh, there is a straightforward case of T3N1 ascending colon cancer, and uh, uh, you are an expert laparoscopic surgeon. And uh, will you be comfortable taking this patient uh, laparoscopically or robotic? And uh, I know that uh, you are doing a great uh, central venous ligation in all of your cases, open laparoscopic or robotic. Uh, what are the challenges that you would see uh, between the two systems, laparoscopy or robotic, uh, when we are talking about CME? 
laparoscopic approach i am a novice as far as robotic is concerned uh, and uh, some shaker would probably uh, say that robotic is uh, superior to laparoscopy but i i don't have much experience in robotic uh, colon surgery but uh, yes definitely uh, uh, if given a choice i would uh, opt for a laparoscopic approach for this patient okay uh, so you know there there were again publications on right colon uh, and uh, robotic versus the laparoscopic right uh, and uh, no conversion in any of this group and uh, this said that uh, anyone or no specific advantage while this uh, another uh, review of 15000 patient uh, it showed that uh, improved survival with uh, robotics of course in their entire uh, 15000 patient only 5% uh, had an error on robotics uh, then this is uh, one uh, trial which is uh, addressing the complete mesocolic excision and uh, there was no conversion in uh, robotic arm while 6.9% in the laparoscopic arm so uh, you know the pendulum is constantly uh, shifting it, it when it comes to conversion that uh, the surgeons are more and more comfortable on the stable platform uh, of the robotic and uh, it says that uh, the conversion this way as well as the advantage of the uh, anastomosis so uh, dr somashekhar after right hemicolectomy what would be your choice intracorporeal extracorporeal agalyan okay uh, see i agree with what rama told uh, um, having done more than 800 robotic colorectal uh, it's very important that as far as uh, oncological outcome is concerned or minimal access nature is concerned there is no superiority of robot or colon when it comes to colon no there are only two place in colon robotic could score and i would always prefer that is number one if it is a total proctocolectomy like you know you have a lynch syndrome uh, or multiple synchronous lesion a robot is then definitely superior to lap when you do a total uh, colectomy and pouch number two uh sometime uh, you know transverse colon malignancy is where you need to take both the flexure uh, robots scores little bit over the lap otherwise right colon classical left colon sigmoid uh, robot would not ever have any advantage neither to patient to the surgeon or outcome or uh, you know minimal access nature that point i fully agree with rama but okay. the only uh, issue is the only issue is if you do uh, robotic all the anastomosis is intracorporeal which always is not if you take a census of all the laparoscopic surgeon who are doing uh, colon surgery uh, except few good centers like rama or you know like uh, saklani where high volume uh, 
majority of the people do extra corporeal anastomosis and it negates the minimal access the moment we do extra corporeal you know uh, there is a more visceral trauma there is more pulling and stretching on the mesentery uh, more dissection of the distal area is required more than oncological requirement whatever you do and uh, do one or two days extra length of stay happens so the whole issue of robotic why i do is we do intracorporeal anastomosis either stapled or hand sewn and then the robot scores over the lab if in robotic you are not going to do intracorporeal anastomosis completely there is no business doing a robotic colon surgery over lab uh, yeah so i i think i would agree and uh, this is what you know uh, us also we have now done uh, more than 250 correctal resection at our institute and we started with obviously extra corporeal anastomosis and uh, uh, especially in high bmi patient uh, we certainly feel that you know it is risky many times you know your patient may bleed because there is a stretch on the mesentery or uh, the anastomosis uh, that you are trying to create uh, you may not be very comfortable so we have started now uh, switching to intracorporeal anastomosis uh, for more or more and more uh, colorectal i mean colon resections uh, dr saklani uh, with uh, you know the robotic staplers are still new for us but uh, other than robotic staplers uh, what is your experience about uh, doing intracorporeal anastomosis and what is your protocol at dmh uh miss i have to say i think we are very short of time most of the time with cases so i think we do mainly rectal surgery for the robotic or we use it for excentrations or extended dissection for colon we do it mainly like what somi said for proctocolectomy my colleague ashwin does uh, most of them actually but intracorporeal sounds like a great thing when we were making intracorporeal conduits then robot is a good thing and uh, also for uh, doing the conduit anastomosis that is quite a good thing so those intracorporeal suturing is a great thing we use less of it but we uh, use it i uh, use it mainly for the rectum for forming conduits and things like that but uh, okay. looks like a good one for colon in the future i think so uh, dr anil uh, with your lot of laparoscopic experience uh, intracorporeal versus extracorporeal anastomosis uh, how your uh, uh, practice has evolved <laughs> so as of now we do most of it uh, extra corporeally uh, uh, since most of these uh, procedures are done uh, laparoscopically we are still more on the extra corporeal anastomosis we are slowly switching over to intra corporeal uh, two or three things one the stapler cost increases uh, a lot of times i think that also plays on our mind when we do uh, uh, an intra corporeal anastomosis Uh, as regards the length of stay uh, yes it is less but most of our patients prefer to stay that much longer in the hospital most of the indian patients do not want to go home uh, early so the return to bowel sounds is 3 uh, days uh, is two or three days it's uh, whatever we do whether we do it intra corporeal or extra corporeal so i don't see uh, a great uh, difference but yes sounds like a good idea so uh, you know this is what has been addressed uh, the stay uh, after the intra corporeal versus extra corporeal and shorter stay of 4 days versus 7 days when you have done intra corporeal so i think uh, all of us uh, probably agree that uh, there is a definitely less trauma overall while doing intra corporeal and that's how the healing is much much better and uh, i certainly see that the future is for more and more intracorporeal anastomosis as opposed to extracorporeal particularly for the obese patient high bmi patient uh, it would be very risky doctor doctor uh, just just wanted to add yeah doctor the more point i think uh, i think all the speakers have covered uh, the another interesting point is that uh, recently we have found that uh, suppose a female patient is there probably if there is any benign conditions like uterus or something if you want to add up uh, you know something like hysterectomy or in this patient probably you know transvaginal uh, delivery of the specimen of entire colon along with the hysterectomy is also one of the additional thing because most of these patients uh, we can put pithotomy position and do the intracorporeal anastomosis and deliver the specimen without any incision 
but we have found that whenever we use a small phenistyl incision their post operative pain is very less and you know next day they start working and second day third day they start taking orally and we have discharged some patients on the fifth post operative day and they'll be very happy and comfortable also i think this is little added and we have stopped even giving some epidural anesthesia and only regional block and little bit of some painkillers can help i think yeah you are right doc which that uh, there is a definite advantage uh, in terms of post operative uh, analgesia requirement uh, now uh, dr ram krishna what would be your choice when uh, there is a case for total colectomy i would prefer a laparoscopic uh, approach for a total colectomy okay uh, there may be advantages uh, of a robotic but i have uh, i'm yet to travel down that path probably uh, some shade that might convince me to do it uh, robotic in a couple of months Okay. Dr. Som, what are the advantages that you would see uh, doing robotic uh, this kind of situations? You know, this is the only place I take a vessel sealer in the robotic. Uh, I analyze there are two things important, uh, not just the quality of surgery. Uh, we know that all of us are uh, oncological principle upholding people at any moment when we do MIS. Uh, even though it is possible to complete if our heart and our experience says that oncologically I'm not doing what I would do, uh, I know that all of us open. Uh, so uh, this is other uh, one place where i take a robotic uh, you know vessel sealer we know that robotic vessel sealer adds 52000 rupees extra no other surgery i take uh, you will be surprised that uh, we have done about uh, 32 robotic uh, uh, total uh, proctocolectomy and uh, nine intracorporeal pouches in robotic by just switching over to robotic vessel sealer not a single clip not a single ligature or a stapler for vascular division uh, almost 55 minutes uh, time i saved uh, so this is one case i start from the world go what i do is i do first left docking i finish complete uh, ultra low lir left colon up to splenic flexure then one docking i finish the whole thing and then the intracorporeal pouch so i would recommend that uh, this is one place uh, i use vessel sealer and i gain one hour uh, you know less time compared to any other technique so i definitely do in this it is not just about the ease uh, also doing a cm like you know complete mesocolic d3 japanese uh, colectomy but uh, i can use vessel sealer so it is very fast i just keep firing from inferior mesenteric artery main trunk middle colic iliocolic everything never ligating never clipping and follow it up using the same vessel sealer as a needle holder for intracorporeal anastomosis because vessel sealer is a use and throw instrument you can't use a fenestrated bipolar progress for as a needle holder next surgery that instrument will be spoiled uh, but the vessel sealer is a bipolar vessel sealer and also a needle holder so this is one tip i would want to use and this is one case thumbs up i do with robotic because i have a vessel sealer and it's an endorister endorist 10 mm uh, uh, you know ligature which goes through 8 mm port uh, people who use that know the advantage of this and it tackle momentum in total collection totally totally with this take, yeah take with specimen yes definitely i i i open the lesser sac i leave the gastrocolic pedicle and i just fire the stapler from hepatic flexure this then i put a t lift to the stomach and i pull it up to the is a fist sternum then i see the middle colic at the pancreas vessel sealer i take that uh, completely okay uh, anil uh, your tips for the total colectomy doing laparoscopically i'm sure you have a lot of experience so uh so when we do a total colectomy i prefer to start from the left side first and then work my way on to the right then finish the right and then do the transvascular on last i think that uh, in that way uh, and keep all the lateral attachments uh, intact because in that way it doesn't keep falling onto my camera um, in that and we we do it with six ports which is uh, which uh, which uh, suffices for doing that the total colectomy so i don't think uh, uh, we should start uh, releasing the entire colon keep the lateral attachments intact because that will prevent it from falling on the camera i think that's very important message that uh, don't uh, release the lateral attachment and this is one uh, study which compared all the procedures and uh, 
they had shown uh, a significant advantage with uh, uh, robotic where the conversion rate was just 1.5 and morbidity and mortality was also less in the robotic arm. Uh, I think a lot we have uh, discussed, anybody uh, wants to still give any specific tip about mitigating complications, say if we are talking about uh, LAR, anything that uh, word of wisdom um, uh, Jagdish bhai, I'll just give two, three tips, which I'm sure everybody has. Uh, I always say that the main complication is uh, a vascular who's bleeding, not because of our bad technique, because, because of the case to case, high PMI, post chemo radiation, sometime going in late after TNT protocol. Uh, our patient, uh, uh, you know, is was on uh, blood thinning agents and oozing. So ba main thing which we are worried is some uncontrolled oozing, which delays. Uh, I always tell this, which everybody knows. There are some tips I do. Uh, there are two types of surgeon, one who keep a gauze inside the abdomen and second who wish they had kept it and I want to be in the first category. First tip, whether you need it or not, I keep two retech gauze. One gauze uh, at the ligament of teres on the left of inferior mesenteric vein, which behaves the small bowel. One, I park it in the pelvis because any oozing, bleeding, the gauze goes, you put a compression, wait for two clotting time, and then go back and see most of the time you don't have to handle it or you can tackle, number one. Number two, if there is oozing, bleeding, you're not making headway, don't go through that area, close it, keep a gauze, come on the other end and come back on that side. Uh, that second issue. Third, if there is a venous ooze on the, uh, you know, uh, like iliac vessels or in the posterior presacral, uh, I increase the uh, pressure of the pneumo uh, by two to four above. And uh, then I don't do much suction or rub it. I try to use more of retech gauze and uh, I do that. Then I always keep a rescue stitch ready. I keep a 4-0 proline with a knot tied and an ab gel put at the edge. So I can just pass it. I don't have to complete a loop. I just pull it and it holds. So these are some of the tips over and above the proper selection of the case, proper MRI imaging, good position, right port placements. Uh, and then knowing the surgical anatomy well, these four or five has actually given me a very good patience to uh, avoid conversion in robotic and keep it very low. I think keeping two gauze is very, very important uh, uh, idea and one must always consider that. Uh, uh, Dr. Saklani, any uh, passionate step or the technical uh, step that you would have uh, developed or you would like to Talk about. I think uh, I think the stapling is the most uh, difficult part, and as we did more, we nowadays we may do even fifteen up to per week or so. Then we realize if you want to fire the stapler from the bottom, so now we do almost interspinctric dissection for almost all patients, and then it can go from left to right very easily. In those patients where you don't want to go posteriorly or do dissect low down for our vascularity. Then we pass the staple anterior posterior first cartridge and the second cartridge laterally. So most important thing is initially we were not dissecting that low. Now if you, I know if I want to fire a stapler, I'm going to do a complete TME. Then we almost dissect the V of the levator and then the stapling becomes really easy actually. But if you're going to do a tumor specific mesorectal relaxation and you don't want to go low down, then for the cartridge, instead of going from left to right, I fire from top to bottom the first cartridge from the left port only. And the second cartridge, I just cross paper. So it becomes like a sort of a V sort of thing. I think that helps quite a lot. From the left port, you say. Uh, From the left port, you turn the echelon or whatever, anteroposterior uh, first cartridge. And so it cuts half of it, but you don't have. And then the limited part of the rectum is left. And you can go from left to right again. So that way you don't have to decide the lowermost part up to the intersymmetric thing. And that becomes pretty okay. So I think it has helped me a bit. And so number of cartridges are only two and the leaks are less. Uh, so this way, uh, can I just give one tip? Uh, you know, uh, because uh, CRM, uh, oncological, everybody follows. What I have found in minimal access is uh, the injury to the inferior mesenteric plexus. Everybody demonstrates superior hepagastric. Everybody demonstrate that nerve trunk at the uh, obturate, you know, sacral pulmonary. 
and then left and right beyond that in minimal axis where the nervi meningitis come from sacroiliac foramen and joins the left and right uh, hypogastric and forms a cavernous now and goes behind the inner layer of denovular fascia people don't do that so it is very important if when you take an ima actually if you go to my youtube considerable time i left on how to do a now preservation at the inferior hypogastric i believe that the true autonomic now preservation is inferior hypogastric plexus in the left lateral wall overlying internal iliac vein everybody does the upper end it has no impact Uh, sexual function and uh, you know this one when in our uh, randomized control trial we specially looked at uh, the sexual performance from the partner evrtc questionnaire residual urine on day 1 we remove in our hospital tubeless surgery we don't put a foley's rights to anything uh, same day feeds and next day patient should pass urine we do a residual check so the tip i want to give is when you take ima go between the vlpf plpf parietal visceral see the nows keep a fascia on that don't use any vessel sealer there it has to be sharp dissection follow it down when you do tme left nerve is always closest to mesorectum very liable to injure give a good traction to the opposite side no harmonic in the left lateral pelvic wall and right lateral pelvic wall use a, a sharp instrument identify the inferior hypogastric plexus and then keep a parietal layer plpf parietal layer of visceral fascia on that and uh, that is extremely important and see until you can keep one layer of denim villers which sup supports the seminal vesicle and prostate so don't bear the seminal vesicle prostate unless oncologically it is required so type 2 tme so this area is something important unfortunately i couldn't edit to 3 minutes i have 15 minutes uh, several video on my youtube showing this uh, this is a tip which people must follow the proof of putting is passing urine on day 1 in any pelvic surgeries with less than 10 ml residual urine and able to have a proper sexual function at the end of 6 month that's incredible you know uh... passing urine on the first day after lar rect surgery is uh, would be incredible i think we must learn it from you bharat we should uh, visit doc so man uh, learn this yes, uh, by yes. ourselves absolutely uh, i think uh, we are probably uh, I, i mean not probably we are already overstepped our time for 5 minutes and uh, thank you so much uh, i think i learned a lot during this discussion and uh, i am obliged by uh, participating in this uh, debate see you soon in person thank you so much